Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Travel Vault webinar. My name is Christina Brazier. I'm the Operations Director of Travel Vault. And today I'm joined by Martin Alcock and Adam Pennyfather from Travel Trade Consultancy and Farina Azam, partner at law firm Kemp Little. Uh, today, we're going to have a usual run through with all of our panelists to um, discuss with the latest developments in the travel industry. Um, we'll, also, we'll also be having a presentation from Martin on his insight onto the impact so far and an outlook on the future. Um, as usual, all attendees are muted for better sound quality, but we would, of course, welcome all of your questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom app. If you have dialed in by phone, please email me instead and I will keep an eye on both and we'll aim to get through as many as possible. You'll also see that we are using the poll function today, which is asking for your uh, asking some questions on refund credit notes and whether you are issuing them to your customers. I see, can see that lots of you have replied already, which is great. Thank you for that. Um, Martin is going to discuss a little bit about that um, and give you some more insight. So uh, Martin, if I can hand over to you for our initial update. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Morning, everyone. Um, I'll explain the poll and the thinking behind the poll in a minute, but the first thing I was just going to update on was um, th this situation with the refund credit notes, because I'm, I'm sure everybody's been, been reading it. Um, you know, it's becoming an, an increasingly fractious debate, I think, in travel. There's definitely um, two clear camps emerging on the, on the sort of to, to refund or not to refund part. So, so just as a very sort of quick recap on all of this, You've got package travel regulations, which are, are, are very clear that in these circumstances, if you sold a package, a customer is is legally entitled to a refund um, if, if if they don't accept whatever alternative you offer to them, and they're entitled to that refund within 14 days. Um, you, you'll have no doubt seen that across Europe, diff, different territories have have moved in different ways to to relax that that 14 days, and, and there's a lot of pressure being put on. UK government to, to do that as well and that that conversation is still going on but as yet we still haven't ha had any move um, move on that so right now the law is still the law 14 days is your obligation to refund but but what ABTA has been leading on is this refund credit note piece which which effectively says ABTA won't pursue ABTA members if they follow a, a very clear set of guidelines in issuing a, a refund credit note and, and, and very specifically call it that rather than a voucher follow certain terms and conditions on on issuing that and and it's this this is all to do with effectively achieving a balance of um you know we can't if we can't change the law and, and hopefully we will still be able to to get that change but if we can't this is the kind of next best thing and and, and hopefully customers will, will kind of um be comfortable with accepting these in, instead um the, the the negotiations with department for business and, and it's department for business Bays, as they call BEIS, who, who lead on this and ultimately make the decision. And so you've got ABTA, CAA, and Department for Transport all kind of trying to convince Department for Business that this is critical. Um, and, and there's two, as we understand it, there's two kind of key pillars to, to this in, in trying to convince Department for Business. One, it's getting the bandwidth with them because Department for Business, as you might expect, has a very wide remit. So even in just in travel, they're looking at airlines and, and the health of airlines, they're looking at airports and, and can airports even, even survive uh, financially. But they're also looking across things like care homes. And so, you know, inevitably, when you start to think about um, what's the priority, is it, is it kind of worrying about getting more ventilators in the care homes? Travel kind of inevitably slips down the pecking order a bit. So the, um, we understand from, from ABTA and, and CAA that they are making some, some progress. They are managing to, to kind of convince the Department for Business that there is this big issue. But one of the things they keep asking for is more data. And so just very briefly, that's the, the purpose of that poll actually is to try to support the CAA with some additional anecdotal evidence on whether this scheme of, of, of refund credit notes is working. So, so really appreciate anybody who's already answered. And if, and if you haven't, if, if you could just give us your thoughts on, on experiences on how it's working so far and how you're finding your customers are, are accepting it, I think that will just go to informing and, and, and it will go to part of that negotiation to try and get the, 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 the rules extended. But the, the, the sort of two core principles that um, I think need to be upheld and, and, and are, are sort of pivotal to, to getting the part of the business to agree to this is that one, customers must retain an ultimate right to a refund. 
albeit that it's a delayed refund. And two is that the money must be protected during that period when, it, when they don't get it back. And so that's why ABT has been very clear on, on the steps that have to be taken to preserve those two points. And, and actually we, um, Travel Trade Consultancy, put out a, a, a very short step-by-step um, -step guide on how you should be complying with these things. You can find it um, on our LinkedIn page and on our website. I think Lucy was going to pop up a, a link in the, in the comments as well. Just really to, to illustrate the almost the step-by-step -step guide that you've, you've got to follow when you're issuing them to make sure that they do fulfill those two core components. So the big change as of last week is that you'll, you'll have no doubt seen ABTA up until now have been using a backstop date of the 31st of July, um, where, whereby the refund credit note would, would have that as the final date. And if no alternative holiday had been booked by then, customers would be required or entitled to get the refund at that point. Obviously, none of us really expect to be much further forward in, in, in what the world looks like by July. So to an extent, it was helpful for a bit of breathing space, but, but not really much else. Now, the reason July was the date was, was because um, really that, that one of those two pillars I just mentioned was, was being able to guarantee that the money was protected. And so for, for ABTA, for the vast majority of ABTA members, they are providing bonds to ABTA and those bonds have an expiry date. And because we, we'd just gone past the end of March, and that's traditionally one of the renewal points in the year, but because that was extended to the end of April, there were a bunch of ABTA members out there who had bonds which were effectively in expiry within, within a matter of months. So the July date really was, was driven by that. Obviously, we're now much further forward in renewing all of those ABTA members. And so ABTA have now come out and said, you don't have to commit to July, but you still have to commit to the date being, the backstop date being within the, t the, the, the dates of your financial protection arrangements. So for, for people who provide bonds, that, that, that really becomes the next bond date. I guess for the vast majority of people on, on this call who are travel vault members, they're using financial failure insurance. And so the, one of the benefits of, of financial failure insurance is that it's a bit more open-ended. And, and, and we've been, um, and the travel vault team have been speaking to, to insurers to get their confirmation. Now, I think for the vast majority of travel vault members, the insurers that, that are insuring their holidays have said they're happy to follow the ABTA guidance, which is basically backstop date, ultimate backstop date is now 31st of March, 2021. Uh, definitely shouldn't be any later than that. There's a case for making it even even earlier than that, and I'll cover that in a, in a second. Um, but for for most travel vault members, their insurers are saying they're happy to follow follow those guide guidelines. There are a handful of travel vault members who are on older insurance policies where there's a bit more of a question mark over it. I, I know the travel vault team have been in touch with those members who are impacted. So. Um, there's dialogue happening and I think if you've got queries on that obviously get in touch with your, your usual contact there. Um, just just very very quickly that the idea of there being an ultimate backstop is again it goes to this point of government trying to government is looking to protect consumers ABTA needs to convince them that this scheme wouldn't be unfair to them. Fair is obviously a, a very grey area and you can debate how long a backstop period would would be fair where everybody uh, CAA, ABTA and Department for Transport have kind of agreed is end of March, that's around a year since, since this started. Anything beyond that starts to look pretty unfair to consumers. And, and the danger is that any, any travel members, any travel companies who are putting dates that are much longer than the 31st of March, they, they risk kind of diluting that message and cutting across the work that's being done to get government to agree to the law change. So, um, that's the sort of update situation on, on um, refund credit notes. As I say, great if you can give us the, the, the data on how your experience is with it, because that will help in this, this, this discussion to, to give it some kind of legal teeth. Um, the uh, the, the, the dates-wise, hopefully it's, it's clear enough for most Travel Vault members, but if you do have a query, obviously get in touch. Um, the, the second big issue is obviously the, um, the risk of chargebacks because all the while that this, these arrangements don't have the legal backing, there is a risk of chargebacks and I, I'm sure there are Travel Vault members on, on the call who are, who are suffering that. Farina's going to go into it in a bit more detail. One thing I would say though, and it's, just, it's, a, it's linked to this refund credit note, but the experience we're having and certainly the conversations we're having with um, the, the Travel Trade Consultancy clients is there's a huge sort of psychology element 
to these refund credit notes where you've got customers who, who frankly are looking at their own financial position and, and, and hoping to get money back. Um, if you go to them and say, here's a refund credit note, give us some breathing space till end of July, uh, then, then they're likely to accept it. Maybe even end of September, end of October, you might, you know, it doesn't seem that far away. The danger is the longer you push that date out, the more likely they are to say, that's too long, I'm gonna just go down the route of a chargeback. And so at the moment, while there's no legal teeth to these changes, there is a danger that you do get hit for chargebacks anyway. And so I think there is a bit of a psychology element to how, how far you push those dates back. So for all Travel Vault and most insurers are supporting the 31st of March, there is an argument for saying if you can afford it and you do have the, the wherewithal putting an earlier date on there might might be uh, a sort of beneficial because in the short term it might just reduce that pressure on the chargeback route. Um, so that, that's all I was gonna gonna cover off. Like I say I know Perina's gonna go into more detail on, on chargebacks, but very happy to take any questions at the end. Thanks, Martin. Um, we discussed earlier also, you had some comments on some further developments with suppliers. I know a lot of our members have previously been saying they've having issues with airlines um, issuing vouchers rather than refunds. Um, yes. Did you have an update on that for our members? Yeah, it, it's sort of anecdotal at this point, but it's certainly good news and it's going in the right direction. I mean, what, what we've heard from a number of tour operators is that airlines who had previously been issuing vouchers and, and refusing cash refunds are now coming back to the table. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a bit uncertain as to what's driving that. Um, I guess there's, there's possibly a bit of, you know, thinking about some of the um, Middle Eastern carriers, you know, the likes of Emirates, excuse me, who, who definitely seem to have started paying cash refunds again. That could be brand preservation, you know, Dubai has sort of staked everything it's got on on tourism and, uh, you know, all of its investment is going into getting more tourists in, into that territory. And so, Maybe it's a realization that people aren't ticketing future holidays that are falling due because they're worried about not getting these refunds and they're sort of realizing that the short term cash saving is, is going to hurt them in the long run. There's also obviously US government, um, US government officials have been quite bullish in forcing airlines to pay refunds. And, and for now, the EU are still sort of pushing this um, denied boarding EU 261 regulation, which, which does obligate airlines to pay refunds. So it could be a combination of both of those, but certainly the anecdotal evidence is that money is starting to flow back, which I, th I think is, is great news. Great, thank you. That's, that's definitely good to hear. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of um, questions on that over the last few weeks. So to get some movement on that with, with airlines is fantastic. Um, Farina, I wonder if I could bring you in at this point. Um, I know you've been dealing a lot with chargebacks again this week. Um, what, what have you been seeing and what advice do you have for our members? Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, so yeah, again, I think my week has been dominated by chargebacks, advising on chargebacks, um, helping prepare responses and, and sort of giving some um, general guidance and advice on how to deal, deal with the chargebacks. Um, so chargebacks, it, it was it was always going to it was always going to start being an issue once you get past the 14 day PTR um, refund period. Um, you know, when customers are unhappy, they are going to look to issue a chargeback. Um, I had some discussions with some sort of with some issuers and acquirers this week on behalf of, of some of our clients. Um, one of the things that we found out was even where um, a client might a customer might start with a section 75 chargeback. Um, the internal processes that the um, um, card issuers and acquirers have is, is that they ultimately will just turn it into a normal chargeback claim. So they won't treat it as a Section 75, they will just treat it as part of the normal chargeback scheme that they have. Um, that means um, one of the main defences that travel agents had in the Section 75, which was that they're not the supplier of the services being purchased, um, doesn't hold as much weight as we'd hoped um, that it would. So that is a bit of a blow to travel agents. My advice is still still mention it in the response, um, but just you know just be wary that it doesn't hold as much weight as we'd hoped. Um, and obviously the, the other thing to say as well is, is make sure you do respond to all, all chargebacks. Um, you know, respond in, in whatever way with, to all chargebacks that you get because that will in itself buy you some time. Um, there's the MasterCard and the Visa gu uh, guidance. Um, there's also some Barclay Card FAQs out, out there. Um, th that is the key, essentially. That's what I've been told, um, that the key is the, the guidance and looking through that guidance. 
um, seeing if there's anything in that guidance that supports you, you know how you've dealt with this customer's um, cancellation. So one of the, the key things that's been mentioned is if a customer has not contacted you and they've just gone straight to a chargeback, um, that you know you need to you need to let um, let the, the issuer and the acquirer know when you respond um, because they will push back a chargeback on that basis because the guidance makes it clear that the customer must contact the merchant first and give the merchant the opportunity to um, to deal with the dispute. Um, so if that's happened, always make that clear because they will push back um, and it, the chargeback won't go ahead. Um, the, uh, the visa guidance. Um, you know, differs somewhat to the MasterCard guidance. So it's not great that they haven't actually got a consistent approach, but um, Visa has said, um, you know, where a cancellation is due to government restrictions, uh, government regulations, that um, wouldn't give rise to a valid chargeback claim because the government regulations um, supersedes and overrides Visa's dispute resolution guidance, um, rule, sorry. Um, but MasterCard actually says the opposite and MasterCard says even where the cancellation is due to government restrictions and regulations, um, the customer is still, is still entitled to make a chargeback claim. Um, so that, that fact that they're not consistent isn't, isn't helpful. Um, but equally, you know, that, that is something which if it's a visa chargeback, that's certainly something to refer to. Um, the, um, and the other thing to say as well is, is you know, when, it, when you are responding, um, send the guidance, attach the guidance, point to the relevant sections in the guidance that supports, um, you know, why you're pushing back on, on this particular charge back. Um, and, and so, I, and, and so yeah, so I, I think my, my, my main advice really is um, to just make sure that you are pushing back on those chargebacks, you are putting yourself in the best possible position to defend them. Um, the one other, uh, other issue to just point out is linking to the refund credit notes. Um, I haven't managed to receive any confirmation um, that the card issuers and the card acquirers would accept a refund credit note as a valid resolution of the complaint. Um, so that's a particular issue that we have that obviously Martin was touching on as well, um, which is if we can't get them to accept refund credit notes, then ultimately uh, all the hard work that we're putting in into sort of getting these refund credit notes um, accepted um, won't really won't really be very useful if customers can just go ahead and, and do a charge back and get their money back that way. Um, so um, the advice that I have is attach the refund credit note. So uh, make sure you issue the refund credit note, attach the refund credit note when you are responding, saying this is how you're dealing with it. And similar to, to what Martin was saying, I think the key here when you are uh, talking about the refund credit note is to make it clear that uh, there is a promise of a refund at the end. So, um, and I think that uh, but perhaps has been missed somewhat in the last few weeks of talking about refund credit notes. Even within the industry, there seems to be this feeling that a refund credit note is not a refund, and uh, that is really bad for the industry. Uh, you know, and that's what we need to sort of start stressing. And I know Avtor is trying to sort of change the discussion on that because a refund credit note is a promise of a refund um, at, at, at you know at a specified date. And what you're basically saying is, ideally, use the refund credit note to book an alternative holiday with us. Uh, but if you don't, you will get a refund by X date. Um, and in, in, you know, if the worst happens and we actually fail in that time period, your payment is still protected. So um, you know, it, it, a refund credit note is a promise of a refund. Um, so I think we really need to sort of stress that and make that clear. Um, I did raise with Avta um, this week the fact that there is this question mark over whether refund credit notes will be accepted um, by the issuers and acquirers and, and what that means. Um, and I know that they are raising it with UK finance and they are trying to, to get to some sort of uh, position where, you know, the, 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 the industry just accepts that these refund credit notes um, are valid for the purposes of, of pushing back chargeback claims, but we're not there yet. So we're still waiting to see what happens. So advice at the moment is if you are issuing refund credit notes, attach it to the chargeback response, uh, make it clear what that refund credit note means. And the fact that ultimately it is a refund that is being given to the customer, it's just, it's just that the customer would have to wait a little bit. Thanks, Farina. That's really helpful. And, and you talked about there um, some guidance and FAQs that have been issued by um, MasterCard and Visa, Visa and Barclaycard. And we'll make sure that those is, that's all circulated to members um, at the beginning of next week with, with some advice on that as well. Um, so that's really helpful. Thank you.
Um, I've had a couple, we've had a couple of questions already, um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind answering them for us. The, the first one is with regards to airlines. Um, some travel agents are requesting us to make an admin fee payment of approximately £30 just to even inquire about refunds for cancelled flights with the airlines. Um, I assume this is not legal in the circumstances? So, I don't, I'm just trying to figure out so the, the, who is the travel agent acting on behalf of, are they acting on behalf of, or uh, do, you, do we mean travel agents are asking customers to pay an admin fee of £30? So the question has come from a tour operator. So I think the tour operator is saying the, the travel agent is say, asking um, the tour operator to make an admin fee, um, which is slightly strange. Uh, perhaps we can ask that um, the person who's asked that maybe to add a little bit extra clarification in there, if that's possible. Um, and we'll go, we'll go on to the next one. Um, so there's a question about liability in a particular circumstances of a trip. So um, they sold a six day package in Peru to four clients as part of a longer trip. They were unable to fly to Peru on account of the government ban on arrival flights. So they didn't take up the package they had sold them. However, they're now in the strange position whereby neither them or the clients actually cancelled the tour they were providing, but obviously it wasn't taken. So what, what is the liability there? What, again, a, a little bit more information really, if it was before the FCO, the UK FCO's um, advisory um, against non-essential non international travel, um, then uh, there it, it was actually they couldn't fly uh, to Peru because of Peru's own restrictions um, on arrival flights so in that case you could say well we were still able to because you obviously you weren't I'm assuming you didn't provide the flights as part of this package so um, you could say we were still able to provide you with you know with the ground arrangements but you were not able to enter the destination um, because of restrictions on on you by the uh, destination um, so in that case, the liability would sit with the customer. But if, if it at all was after the FCO's advisory um, against non-essential international travel, then arguably the, uh, you, there is more, there's more chance of the liability sitting with the tour off. Because then, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's to do with the UK uh, advisory. And then the, the other part of it is as well, whether you you know you have to say to yourself honestly could we have provided that trip in peru um you know were you still in a in 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 a position to be able to provide it possibly not because if peru had their own restrictions um you know social distancing um you know uh, and that that kind of thing that would probably mean that no you would you wouldn't have been able to provide that peru trip anyway uh, but really what you need to know what we need to know for that is we really need a timeline and date um as to when you know when that holiday was due to depart um, and how that links to the Peru restrictions and the UK restrictions. Thanks, Verena. Hopefully that gives some help. But if, um, if you do need further clarification on that, then please feel free to email me and we can maybe go into specifics um, offline. Um, normally we would come to Adam at this point to see whether there's been any kind of any developments from a, from a financial point of view in terms of the government support measures that have been um, offered offered. Adam, do you have any, um, any updates over the last week that you've seen that you would like to comment on? Um, morning, everybody. I think um, not necessarily, I know in previous calls we've spoken about sea bills. There haven't been uh, too many developments in the past week. Uh, still quite slow going, so no particular updates there. Um, but in terms of the grants, we are actually seeing now some um, cash hitting people's banks. Uh, and so if you are eligible or think you might be eligible for those grants and you haven't received anything, uh, I'd urge you to get in contact with your local authority just to see what's happening. Um, I think the government guidance initially was that your local authority will be in contact with you, uh, but actually we're experiencing a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some, some local authorities are requiring you to fill in forms on their website, some are getting in contact and some are just putting cash in people's banks, which is nice. Um, but not, not the case uh, for everybody. So if you think you're eligible and you haven't received anything, then please get in contact with your local authority. 
Great, thanks for that. And if anyone has any questions, then please um, submit them on the Q&A and, um, and we can come back to Adam later on. Um, also, the polling, is, or the polling is going really well. Uh, thank you for those who are taking part in that. If for any reason you can't see it, it should, there should be an option on the bottom toolbar on the Zoom app, which says polling, which will bring it up for you. And um, you know, that's asking some really useful questions on reef and credit notes that we can feed back. Um, so Martin, if you wouldn't mind, we'll move on now to your presentation, um, some slides on, on where we are and potentially the future. No problem. Uh, so hopefully you can see the, uh, the slide deck there. So the, the, the intention of this really is, is um, certainly I'm no medical expert and uh, nobody really knows what the, what the future is going to look like. So it's really to run through some of the things we're seeing right now, I guess to pose some questions and, and to raise some, so, some things that people should be thinking about uh, as we move through the crisis and as we, as we come out of the other side. Um, I, I think for me, it would be really helpful if anybody has differences of opinion or, or additional things that we should be factoring into this, because it would be good to uh, make sure that this continues to evolve as, as we move through. So, so yeah, any feedback would be would be greatly appreciated. I, I think just really that you know the the impact and the speed of the impact I think is is what what's taken most of us by surprise. You know, there's lots of ways you can measure that, but for me, it's this is the the best indicator. I mean, you might remember I, I sat and listened to uh, Tui's group financial earnings call for their first quarter, including their, their January trading, 11th of February. Uh, it was and 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 on that call it was when Tui, you know, but it was bordering on um, bordering on arrogance. Possibly they were, they were, they'd had the greatest trading month they'd ever had in their entire history. It obviously benefited hugely from Thomas Cook's failure and and, and taking a lot of that capacity. Um, so that was 11th of February, 27th of March. They were going cap in hand to the German government for a bailout, and that's 45 days difference. Um, that's the sort of speed and so I guess as a consequence of that speed we, we don't have a huge amount of data to really measure it but what we do have is is you know a few bits here and there and, and, and a bit of anecdotal evidence this is kind of the typical um, the, the typical approach that that um, chart there is showing gross uh, gross bookings so, so, so the, the net booking position when you take into account refunds as well as just new bookings coming in the door and, and the green line is um, the, the sort of seven day rolling average of transactions. You, you can see that very, very quickly after having a, a fairly positive start to the year, it's deteriorated. And that, that sort of 65 to 85% down is, is what we're seeing fairly regularly in, in, in all forms of data. Uh, you know, here's, here's something else. This is a, a heat map of, of, of web searches and you can see uh, week by week, it's, um, you know, you probably can't read it so well, but you've got uh, hotels at the top and travel at the bottom. And you can see that by the time you get into the sort of week commencing 29th of March, week commencing 5th of April, you are very much in the red in all of those travel hotspots, you know, 80% down. That's, that's web searches and tra travel related web searches. So it's, it certainly in implies that that intention to travel is, is still way down. Um, the, the food delivery one on there is, you know, just, just out of interest, really. You know, you can, you can certainly see that that's kind of the inverse of what we're going through in travel. Similarly, IATA have put some data out on, on worldwide flight capacity. You can see that that just completely fell off a cliff. And again, percentage wise is, is, is in that same sort of ballpark. I, I think right now, you know, even, even if you wanted to, you'd probably struggle to find a flight. This is about the, as good as it's getting. So if, you want, if, you, if, you're, if you're nostalgic, then maybe you could try this at the weekend. So look, what we're seeing is across the board, travel companies, airlines, taking all kinds of action. Obviously, capacity has been slashed, planes grounded, um, ships in, in dock, government support, all of that stuff that you'd have read. Um, this is a, a survey that was put out for, for founders and startups, so kind of relevant to a lot of people on, on the call, you know, the kind of actions that, 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 that you're, you're, you're seeing. And again, no, probably no surprises in any of that. Big cuts to, to um, headcount, hiring freezes you know people looking to pivot and we'll sort of cover some of those ideas a, a, a bit later obviously cash is king we talked about that and that's really that that whole issue around um refund credit notes there's this sort of money musical chairs game going on at the moment and depending on where 
you sit in the supply chain and where the money is gives you a sort of degree more power than, than, than the next. You're also seeing as I think, unfortunately, things are getting um, harder, you're starting to see fractures appear in, in the, the relationships. You know, early days of this crisis, I think to an extent, everybody was, was singing from the, the, the same song sheet in terms of the approach. You're obviously now seeing some opportunism in, in, in this sort of refund versus not refund debate. I think you're also seeing, um, you know, agents, for example, looking to protect their position at the expense of tour operators. Um, certainly you'd seen airlines issuing vouchers and, and looking to protect themselves. And, and it was, the, again, the tour operators caught in the middle. I, I think that the thing is, wherever you stand on that supply chain, uh, and I'd even maybe factor in the, the, the merchant acquirers and the insurers who, you know, in one sense haven't, haven't sort of covered themselves in glory. But I think wherever you stand and whoever's lens you view the world from, you can understand what they're trying to do. It's, it's all about preservation. Um, and, and I do feel that's going to get, get worse. But one issue that probably we're going to have to unwind on these credit notes is that obviously operators like the guys on the call are giving out refund credit notes to customers. But in large numbers of cases, that is because they are getting refund credit notes from their suppliers. Now, I, I think possibly customers are being told or, 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 or are under the misapprehension that those refund credit notes will be some sort of flexible um, discount voucher that will allow them to redeem it against some future holiday. But the reality is, if you as the tour operator are so tied into a supply chain of vouchers for underlying suppliers, you know, if, if, if you had a customer who wanted to go skiing in the Italian Alps during the Easter holidays, and you're saying, well, rebook in, at, at Christmas, they're going to want to go somewhere different perhaps and, and and you're saying well no you still got to use that same voucher because I, I i haven't got the cash back i can only send you to that same italian hotel so that unwinding of credit notes i think is going to be hugely complicated um it, it raises all sorts of questions i think um you know it goes without saying though that the longer the crisis goes on you know cash becomes more and more of a problem and i think um that there isn't a business in the world that that can sort of withstand a a very very long period of no no new money coming in the door. This this is probably about as typical as as it gets for the conversations with clients as to what this what the recovery might look like. So this is um, this is the months of 2020. The orange line on there is is the sort of expectation again on that on that net booking when you can't when you factor in cancellations. Excuse me. Um, you know we're well over 100 percent down, and, and the reality is it's going to be a very slow build back up. So so. You know, in this case, we're not predicting any any sort of recovery till the other side of June, probably July, and then things will start to improve, but but slowly. Um, I, I, again, just a, a, a survey on um, venture capital funds and when they expect the recovery versus how how the, the founders that they're funding. This based on about sort of five hundred, I think, overall a combination of the two, and you can see that really it's it's beyond April 21, when the vast majority of, of VCs are expecting life to get back to normal. Um, you, you know, mixed, mixed views on, on what happens before then. Um, slight upside and, and, and a sort of rare piece of good news though, is that certainly amongst that VC community, and again, will be, will be relevant for, for, for many on this call, that, that actually the, the, the noise that, 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 that what they're saying certainly is that they haven't massively changed their investment strategy. I mean, this is a survey that was done on the 5th of April, I think. So uh, very, very recent, 50% of VCs are saying they aren't going to change their investment strategy at all, given the, given the conditions. And that second chart on there is saying, what's the impact on their rate of capital deployment? And so 5% of people are spending more than, than they, they, they would have previously, about 16% spending the same. And, you know, 35% so a third of people still kind of spending 80% of, of, of what they would have on investing in, in new businesses. So some good news there, I think. Um, I think looking forward and trying to understand what the recovery might look like, I, I, I think it's, there's a few things, a few questions that, that you need to, to try and think through. I, I think the idea of it being um, a, a sort of homogenous recovery that, 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 um, lifts everybody at the same rate is, is, is probably, you know, naive at best. I think that the, the shape of the recovery though, I mean, you read a lot about whether it's a V shape, so a very, a very rapid return, almost as fast as we went into the crisis, uh, you know, say that's pretty unlikely given the, the, the kind of economic um, recession type crisis that, that, it, that, that is following this, the, 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 the U shaped recovery, which is, 
slightly elongated period of, of, of downturn, but then we get back reasonably quickly to, to where we are or where we were before this. Again, I, I, I think it's, um, it, it, it's maybe a little bit ambitious. An L-shaped recovery, which is you know, something more like what you saw in the financial crisis, which took maybe three or four years to get back to the same sort of level. I think for me, it's probably more something in travel particularly, not, not necessarily um, looking at the economy more broadly, but for travel, I think it probably is more, more of a kind of W type shape. So what, what that means is, you know, they've got this pent up demand right now with people stuck indoors. I, I think as soon as there are restrictions lifted, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about what that might look like, but as soon as restrictions are lifted, I could see a, a huge um, bounce back in, in some kind of travel, whether that's domestic or, 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 or what that might look like. But I think as you get towards the end of the year, the economic reality of um, large numbers of people being furloughed, job security, um, all of those will, will weigh on the, the, the longer term. And I think it could be almost 2021 where you see the sort of second dip where, you know, people need that break right now just for, you know their, their own sanity but but actually the, the the financial situation means that there's a there's a bigger problem next uh, next summer uh, the, the the shape of when that sort of second arm recovers again is 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 something you could debate um as i say though I, th I think one thing is absolutely certain is that the recovery will be very unevenly distributed um you know the the, the, the sort of the, the obvious way that it would be uneven is by dem demography uh, certain, certainly by age group, you know, that the, the over 60s, over 70s traveller has really powered a huge number of um, successful travel businesses. If you look at most of the, 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 the private equity buyouts, for example, that have, that have taken place in the tour operator space, whether it be, you know, Riviera, Great Rail Journeys, Audley Travel, a, a huge amount of their income has come from these baby boomers and, and, and empty nesters who have been the people with the wealth um, and, and the free time to, to travel and they're, and they're more um, you know, adventurous than, than maybe previous generations. The, the, the big danger is you, you, you see, or you, or you read some of the commentary around how the restrictions might be eased and whether they like it or not, I think people in this group will find themselves being classed as high risk. They will be therefore limited as to maybe where they can travel even if they even if they wanted to go abroad they maybe won't be allowed by certain countries i think you bring in the, the travel insurance piece that we'll talk about later if they can't get insurance for the trip does that mean that they won't book and so i think i think there's a huge issue around the resurgence of, of, of people in that that bracket you know logically younger people and families would bounce back a bit more quickly but then you factor in you know, people who've been furloughed for three months and, 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 and lost 20% of their salary or, or, or potentially been made redundant. You, you, you look at people who have maybe incurred a huge amount of debt in propping up their own businesses, for example, and, um, you know, deferring tax bills, VAT bills, etc., which all ultimately have to be paid and, will, and, and may well put a lot of pressure onto 2021. So it's, it's really difficult um, to second guess it, but I, th I think it's it's certain that it won't all happen at once, and different people will, will will take a different view to that. And I think you look at your own business and what the demographics of your customer base is. I think you, you need to try and segment that in some way and, and, and come up with your own assumptions. I, I think the other obvious thing is 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 by destination. I mean, in, inevitably, international recovery will be slower than domestic. You're already starting to see that a little bit in in China. Not a huge amount of data coming out of it, but but certainly domestic travel has, has starting to show, show early signs of recovery. A lot of that has been powered by this uh, VFR, visiting friends and relatives. Um, and, and again, you could see the same thing would happen in the UK. You know, you've got this period of, of pent up demand and, 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 and lockdown. As soon as that, that's open and people are able, they, they maybe will travel in the UK. I also think there's a much stronger um, UK government case for opening up domestic travel from an economics point of view, you know, both business travel, um, but, but visiting friends and relatives, it seems like an easier one to, to make the case for. I think the reality is international restrictions will take much longer to, to come off. You know, on the way into the crisis, you, you certainly saw different countries acting in different ways and at different times, and, and no reason to think they're all suddenly going to just open um, in unison. The, the um, Reality again, I think, for, for different destinations is that they will open up based on some kind of, this is pretty unscientific, but some kind of 
metric of dependence on tourism versus their success in however you measure that in, in fighting the, the, the disease. Um, countries who are highly dependent on tourism and have had a high degree of success in, in, in keeping cases at bay will, will bounce back quickly. And um, from what you read, places like the Caribbean and, and, and even one or two places in Europe, Cyprus particularly, who seem to have dodged the worst of the, of the, um, of, of the cases and, and, and you would imagine would be, would be more prepared to start, start bringing international tourists in more quickly. Kind of the other end of the spectrum is somewhere like the US where they're not hugely dependent on tourism and, and, and seemingly have had a, a much harder time in containing things. So you would imagine that would be more, more tricky in the early stages. I, th I think everybody else is some kind of, you know, me messy recovery. And again, if you're in a, the type of um, business where you're looking to take customers to different territories and maybe cross borders during the course of their trip, you could see that that's going to play, you know, make those sorts of tours really difficult. Um, I think you can't underestimate the, the the impact on just psychologically or the impact of consumers and, and their buying habits generally. I mean, I think after two months and we just obviously extended that lockdown by another three weeks and, and who knows for how much longer, but are, are people going to want to go straight into a kind of group tour, uh, you know, go, go to like a, a large resort where everybody is sort of crammed in, even if they are allowed to from social distancing points of view, or are they are they changed? Are they more likely to want to have you know the slightly more um, you know rural experience over the kind of bustling market? Again, I think you need to look at your products and and and, and ask those sorts of questions. And um, I, I think it, I think there's a real question mark over whether people will go straight back to the those sorts of habits and the way they were traveling. I mean, even look at people with families. Are they going to want to go straight back to airports? Airports were, were sort of you know hugely sort of implicit in this whole spread of this virus and you know all sorts of negative stories about the the, the kind of cleanliness and, and all that sort of stuff are, are people going to want to jump straight back into airplanes or they're going to want to look at driving holidays for a year or two where, where you're a bit more in control and, and that sort of whole social distancing is a, is a bit easier to manage I think again the, the the actual experience of travel is is going to be hugely different. I mean, take a, a few things here again. The, the 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 reports and the and the speculation is that once we are finally released, we may well be headed for a period of kind of on-off lockdown. So uh, as pressure builds and cases builds on and, and pressure builds again on health services, you might find that different countries have to go back into lockdown for a period. Um, with that degree of uncertainty, I think that obviously drives later bookings. So I think customers will will be waiting till closer and closer to departure to commit to something, which again, cash flow management side of things becomes very difficult. Um, there was lots of news yesterday about EasyJet talking about how they manage the social distancing side of things on an airplane and talking about leaving, for example, the middle the middle seat in the in the aircraft empty. All of those three things together put just huge demands on or, 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 or have major impacts on the supply and demand curve. If you're managing a yield curve for, a, for an airline and you've potentially got these narrow periods where people can travel and then they can't, coupled with we can only sell two thirds of the, of the airline, of, of the, air, the seats on the aircraft, coupled with later and later booking patterns, you're going to see huge shifts in pricing, which again, if you're trying to price up a holiday and, 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 and sell that holiday and, and sort of work out when you get the money in for that. I, I think it has huge implications for that. So definitely you need to be looking at your risk management processes. You need to be looking at your foreign currency buying practices, et cetera, to make sure you don't get caught out by some of that. Um, I think the products that you're offering, if you start to build in what is likely to be requirements for social distancing, you know, if you're, if you're running guest houses or you're running activities in, in, in foreign countries, where you're taking groups on, on, on whatever tour that might be, and you now have to build in some sort of social distancing aspect to that, as well as the hygiene and, and, and deep clean that, that, that you're seeing in, in, in places like hotels and car hire companies. That all has to be factored in. There's a cost to that. There's planning that's required for all of that. So we need to start working through what is likely and, and, and what are the likely scenarios. Again, that could be different in different territories, but certainly something to have on your radar. I think it seems inevitable that we're heading for enhanced identification type type protocols. I think, um, you know, as well as the passport, you could well be seeing some sort of 
certificate for immunization or, or whatever this is um, you know straight out of hollywood stuff but actually is already happening in some far east this is hong kong the uh the, the one on the right there um you as a as a tour operator have to again think about how you build these sorts of things into, into your practices who's going to manage it i mean logically it would seem like it's the airlines in the same way as a lot of the um you know the esther type type um arrangements are, are managed I think just that the experience of flying generally, you know, long queues, increases of denied entry if there are, if there are, what we're hearing is there'll be, you know, swabs and health tests on entry and that sort of thing. So having a process to be able to manage groups of your customers arriving and being denied entry and having to, to, to come home, even things like mandatory self-isolation for 14 days on arrival, there was a number of countries who are still implementing that. Clearly totally unworkable if you're, if you're selling two week family holidays. Um, and then add on all of that something you just mentioned earlier is 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 the travel insurance aspect of this um something like 30 uk travel insurers have, have pulled cover they're not selling travel insurance anymore and another 19 of them have changed the cover that they're offering um again this is this is likely to be the case going forward you're going to see exclusions for coronavirus related uh, incidents and so again if you're a vulnerable traveler or if you're traveling with a family or are you likely to want to put your family in a position of having to rely on local health care without necessarily the insurance cover this, this i think has huge implications for how fast we, we recover um, you might start to see some of this bounce back but but this is this has all come from a the, the, the witch report i think a, a week or so ago where uh, and, and certainly me, me looking at some of these sites seem to suggest that they, they all uh, are off sale for now um, Running a business generally, I think, is is obviously going to come come with a number of challenges. We're already seeing some of this off the back of um, Thomas Cook and one or two other big failures last year. But um, capacity in the bonding market has has had started to become a problem anyway. I, I certainly see that that's going to continue. Um, likewise, other types of insurance, whether that be supplier failure insurance. If you're running a trust account and you're requiring supplier failure insurance to be able to get your money out, and that supplier failure insurance isn't available anymore, then that that has major implications. I think there's then some much more philosophical questions around the regulatory framework and how that's acted and, and, and whether it's worked in the same way as maybe the FCO and their advice. Uh, you know, these longer term questions, I'm sure we will see um, that there are certainly implications and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll see discussions on. So I'm conscious that that's all pretty negative stuff. So I thought I'd try and end just with some, some silver linings and, and, and some sort of upsides and opportunities. You know, the first one is obvious. I do think after this long period of, of lockdown, everyone's going to need a break. Um, question marks over what that might look like. And, and I think worth you looking at, can you create a domestic type products and tours if you don't already sell them? Um, can, you, can you create stripped back versions of the tours you're already selling to cater for the fact that you're going to have customers who maybe don't have the financial resources they did previously? Uh, I'm definitely not saying discount here. I think discounting is the, 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 the fastest way to, to ruin. And if you're selling less holidays and you're making less margin on each one, you, you're going to exacerbate the problem. But something like a, you know, a, a, a sort of gold, silver and bronze version of the same tour with each version having you know, slightly less bells and whistles on there um, at a discounted price might help. Uh, not discounted, sorry, but reduced price might, might, um, might help to sort of maintain the cash flow maintain your, your sort of customer relationships but um yeah definitely definitely not offering blanket reductions i think i think if we do see that in a large way when we come out of this then i think the whole industry has has bigger issues to deal with and i think catering for we we we, we work with a lot of tour operators who just simply aren't geared for last minute bookings you know they're used to having much longer booking windows well if the lockdown does get eased and there is any of this summer season salvageable um, I, I think being in a position to capitalize on that because I do feel there will be people with money to spend and they will want these experiences and they'll want to get out. Um, what you don't want is to find that you're ruled out of selling anything this year just simply because you're not, your systems aren't, aren't capable. Uh, and then just that point we touched on before, I think these new social behaviors, whether, whether they're just behaviors or whether they're legal requirements around social distancing, I think recognize the fact that maybe people who had booked on 
large cruise ships uh, or, or, or large resorts where everybody is, is, is packed in and, and, and that was part of the attraction. Maybe that, that changes and maybe people will be looking for something a bit more, uh, you know, more solitude and that sort of thing. So I think there are opportunities for people who get this right and, and, and start to think about what products will work because I think the market is, has definitely shifted and, and, and if you're at the forefront of that, there are, there are certainly opportunities. Likewise, I think there will be customers up for grabs. Um, this is something we're calling the pissed off customer carousel. Um, it, and it kind of works like this. Every tour operator we speak to is, is frantically giving out credit notes and, and almost in, in that position of um, keeping the customer happy and keeping the business alive or, or incompatible and, and, and you can't achieve both. So you've got tour operator one, uh, let's say 25% of its customers are so pissed off that they move over to tour operator two who welcomes them with open arms and, you know, I can't, I can't believe they treated you like that. Um, meanwhile, 25% of their pissed off customers go to tour operator number three and so on and so on. And I think you could definitely see that people will, will move around. You know, I think there's no getting away from it that travel companies and certain brands have had a, had, had a tough time in the press and, and there are people who are, um, you know, stirring that up and, and, and making money off that. But, but that's the reality. I think there will be customers who maybe have always been with a particular brand who will now be up for grabs. And I think if you can, if you can get in there, um, there's an opportunity. Likewise, getting attention ought to be cheap. You know, in, in, in the history of business, every recession or downturn, larger companies will cut, quite, cut quickly and cut fast and, and often will cut too deeply. And so that leaves a space for businesses that are a bit more nimble and a bit more innovative. Um, it's inevitably going to throw opportunities for mergers, acquisitions and partnerships that wouldn't maybe otherwise be there. You know, the obvious one is, is, is a, a business with cash buying something that's struggling. But actually, I think at a smaller level, there are opportunities for partnerships. Um, I think of travel vault members who maybe aren't competing on product, but have similar customer bases and maybe could rationalize back office functions and, and, and partner up in that sort of way. Um, opportunities will present themselves like that and I think if you're in the right forums and having the right conversations you, you know you'll, be, you'll, you'll come across them. Similarly I think there will be talented people for, for hire in, 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 in roles that maybe they wouldn't look at previously or, or maybe wouldn't be available previously. The reality is big companies will, will have to, to, to let people go and you might find that you, you're able to, to attract somebody that wouldn't ordinarily be on the market. Uh, and finally, I, I do think we, we, when all this is said and done, I think we'll be headed to a, a period of, um, you know, it could well be a seller's market in that all of this uninvested capital that you, you I'm sure, have read about hasn't gone away. It's still there and it, and it needs to be deployed by private equity firms. To Two trillion of, of uninvested capital, you know, as of, as of December a few months ago. Um, and, and the way private equity work particularly is obviously the, the clock is ticking. They have a 10 year fund. They have to go and invest in some businesses. They, they have to grow them and, and, and turn them around and, and make them more operationally efficient and profitable. And then they have to sell them. And if we've lost six months of that 10 year fund, then when we get out of this, you're going to have an awful lot of investors who are, 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 are time pressured and desperate to, to, to put some of that capital to work because the, the, the fund is kind of running out of time. Um, that, ought to be a recipe for slightly higher valuations. Of course, going the other way, you've got a very difficult trading period we've just been through. So I think for the best businesses, you could well find that at the end of the year, there are some, um, some, some, some good valuations to find. Um, but of course, none of those silver linings matter much if you're not around to, to enjoy them. So I, I think just summarize really, I, I think between now and the end of this crisis, it, it comes down to Discipline, cash flow management, taking advantage of as much of the support as is available, and, and obviously Adams mentioned some of that earlier. And I think you know, hustling and, and, and sort of dodging as much as you can is the name of the game, as the, as the great man taught us. So that's all I was going to cover. I'm not sure how much time we've got for slides, but very happy for questions rather. But I'm very happy to um, take any questions as they come up. Uh, equally, if you've got any thoughts or any sort of alternatives on um, how you think the world might look, but I'd love to hear them because I think um, you know we can all sort of learn through this. But yeah, that's otherwise me done. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Martin. That was really helpful. There was so much food for thought there, and nice to have some silver linings at the end. Um, we've had one question for you. you Chris, or is she still there? Oh, I am. Can you hear me? 
Hello? I can hear you, Chris. You've lost, Chris. Oh, I think Martin's lost me, but hopefully the rest of you can hear me. We can see you, Chris. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll um, turn to everyone else then if Martin's not there. Um, we've asked for thoughts on, you know, wh whether instead of discounting, tour operators should potentially consider higher balances or higher deposits and bringing balances forward. Um, presumably, though, if you want to catch customers coming off that pissed off carousel, that might not be a good idea. Any thoughts from that? I'm sorry, Chris, I, I managed to somehow put myself on, put the thing on mute, so I, di I didn't catch the first half of the question. You couldn't just g give me that again, could you? Yeah, absolutely. So we've had comments from someone saying, uh, you talked about not discounting um, going forward, you know, not recommending that as an option. Um, but, you know, somebody's asked, what about actually increasing the deposit that you're asking from customers and, um, you know, bringing the balance date forward? Is, is that a good tactic? Uh, and, you know, my comment was that potentially if you want to catch customers coming off the carousel of other tour operators maybe that's not such a good option yeah look any of this is is there's a, there's a degree of um you know market forces and supply and demand isn't there so i, I think it, it ultimately that will come down to the the, the product that you're um the product you're selling the the, the, the degree of uniqueness if you like I, I think um like we always say on, on these sorts of calls you know if you're if you're um, selling a highly differentiated product that can't be can't the, the experience can't be picked up elsewhere then to an extent you can you can sort of write your own rules whereas if you're competing with the large OTAs if you're competing with when this opens up the likes of um, on the beach and TUI and, and, and Jet2 who have got a huge amount of capacity to, uh, to to try and you know get get people onto seats I would expect they will all be discounting, and if you're in that game and you're competing with them, then then you're unlikely to be able to to, to move those kind of fundamentals of you know, balance due dates and deposits and things. So again, that comes down to ideally, if you've got you need to be thinking about your your product and making that as as defensible as possible. Thanks, Martin. And um, in case you didn't hear, hear me earlier, thank you for your presentation. There was plenty of food for thought there and nice to have some silver linings at the end of it. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm sure you'll get lots of feedback from, from people afterwards with comments. Um, there was stuff coming through on the chat there, which is, which is great. And um, also thank you to everyone for continuing with the uh, polling. If you, there's still time to add your um your answers on there if you can we we've just had um one more question uh which martin you may have a comment on but also farina the um the attendees said that they they're acting acting as agents rather than tour operator so are they right in stating that they cannot give the refund until they have it from the supplier well yeah farina definitely better place but what I, what i would say is that absolutely if they're acting as an agent they're the contractual terms are between the customer and the tour operator. And so an agent going off and, and, and giving a refund um, seems to cut through that quite quite significantly. What do you think, Farina? Yeah, I agree. So the liability to refund is with the package organiser. So if you're acting as an agent for the package organiser, uh, you don't have that liability to refund. Um, and yeah, you, you, sh you certainly shouldn't be taking that liability on. So you've got to wait for the tour operator mm. to package organiser to send that refund on. Equally, it's worth mentioning. I mean, we did hear of an instance this week where the um, tour operator had issued the refund, but actually the agent had issued a refund credit note. Um, that that obviously is is not permitted, and and you know operators should be making sure their agents are clear on that. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, for, partly for the same reasons, partly that you know morally as well as legally, that doesn't doesn't feel right. Obviously, don't know the intentions of um, what was behind that, but um, yeah, that would seem definitely against against the rules on all of this stuff yeah i mean you're you're in you're you know you're acting as an agent and when you receive the payment from the tour operator you should be passing that on to the customer and no doubt that's included in, in the agency agreement so it's a breach of your agency agreement and um you know uh, the the other issue is the financial protection element of it as well because um you know if, if as an agent the agent fails whilst holding on to that that customer's payment the tour operator remains liable ultimately uh, even though you, you know even though, uh, to, to refund to the customer so um that it's wrong on, on a lot of levels great thank you for that and just finally because conscious of time um one of our attendees has said do you feel the approaches to um bays dft caa abta from the industry are being stark enough in setting out the threat to the industry and presumably if, if you think 
they're not what what can be done by our members and people in the industry to to set that out you know to provide the the real awareness that that, that they are going to be one of the most significant sectors hit by this crisis i i have a, well, i've heard from four four or five different people who who are speaking to the pump for business and i have this horrible feeling that one of the things crossing their mind is yeah yeah everyone keeps saying it's terrible but we haven't seen any failures yet so it can't be that bad and and i and i do feel that um, that is partly their attitude. You know, to some extent, again, you can you, you can see their, their 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 position is that they are looking across lots and lots of different business sectors, and there's only so much bandwidth to go. Um, clearly, what nobody wants is a huge failure to to sort, of, and then they then they kick in and, and that sparks their interest. But I, I I think everything I'm being told from Abter and the CAA is that they're doing everything they can to make the position stark. There were some numbers came out the other day. I don't know if you saw this, but. Um, analysis, combined analysis from CAA and ABTA suggests that there was four and a half billion pounds of customers' monies collected as at the end of March for future departures. And 1.8 billion of that was for April and May departures, which clearly can't happen. You know, question what's going to happen beyond that. But definitely that 1.8 billion is the scale of the problem. And that 1.8 billion either gets pushed down the road to, to people rebooking later in the year, or it gets refunded or it gets pushed through chargebacks and you've got an atoll scheme that's got little over 30 million quid in it you've got an apta scheme that's got some resources but you know 1.8 billion there's no way that those departments could cope with if all of that got pushed back through businesses would fail ultimately the government's the backstop and so what abstra and CAA are telling us is that that data those positions have been made clear the department for business does finally have its head around it it's just trying to grapple with you know is it anti is it anti consumer and, and how can they square that bit? So I feel like the case is being made very strong. I think things like this request for data is helpful. You know, the, the, barely barely a week after the whole lockdown started, IATA was able to quickly get data from all of its airlines to put out some messaging and, and, and sort of a unified message. And, and I think maybe we haven't been as quick as doing that, but it, it does seem behind the scenes like that's happening. Thanks, Martin. That's really useful. Um, and just to say, uh, with regards to your slides, we are able to circulate those to our members, aren't we? Yeah, um, I can take out the Muhammad Ali or the, or the Daft TikTok videos <laughs> if you'd like, or I can add them in, whatever you let me know. I'm sure they need to be kept in. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our panellists today. It's been a really helpful session has hopefully given some of our members, you know, a, an insight into, into how to approach things going forward. Um, we will be having another one next week. We're hoping to be joined by Bruce Martin from Jim Juice, um, who specialises in social media and we'll have some advice and tips on, on how to keep co communicating with your customers over this period. So um, we'll be in contact with you all about that early next week. Um, we will also be, we also have recorded this webinar, which will be on our YouTube channel and details will be issued shortly. Thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you to the panelists and um, hopefully speak to you all again soon next.